talked about springs in class today. So the first problem I'm going to give you is about a spring at an odd angle for no good reason whatsoever. So I'll tell you the reason. Practice with vectors. That's the real reason I've put this at the odd angle. So a spring is fixed at one end, the other end is connected to a block. I'll redraw the picture here. It's connected to a block of mass M, where M is 125 grams, and I'm just going to go right now and convert this to 0.125 kilograms. That's very important to do. The spring is constrained so that it will stretch out along a direction that is 30 degrees below the horizontal. The spring has equilibrium length L naught equals 0.25 meters. And in the picture, that's L naught, but is currently stretched to a longer length of 0.37 meters. The spring constant of the spring is 137 newtons per meter. A. What is the unit vector L hat pointing along the spring? All right, and so this part of this really is, the reason I had the spring at this degree angle instead of along x, which would have made it easier, is so you would have to practice with this. And, or so I would show you an example, really, because you're not doing this, I am. So remember, L hat points along the spring towards the end where the thing is connected to the spring. So what that means is L hat, and I need to define a coordinate system. Let's define x and y like that. And this really is vertical, so we've got gravity to think about. We'll think about that later. And this is the angle that's 30 degrees. We know that the length of L hat is 1, because it's a unit vector, so its length is 1. So that means this angle here is going to be cosine 30 degrees, and this angle is going to be sine 30 degrees, because adjacent over hypotenuse is supposed to be cosine. So cosine 30 divided by 1 is cosine 30 degrees. Now, here's a thing that you may remember and you may not remember. It turns out 30, 60, 90 is a special, um, let me really make it look like 30, 60, 90. 30, 60, 90 is a special kind of triangle. 30 degrees, 60 degrees, or pi over 6, pi over 3 as I prefer, 90 degrees. It's a right triangle where it works out that if this length is 1, that length is 2, and this length is root 3. Or at least that's what the ratios of the three lengths are to each other. Um, you can try this. You can make sure the Pythagorean theorem works. 1 squared is 1. Root 3 squared is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. So, hey, the Pythagorean theorem works. But this also suggests that sine of 30 degrees right, is, is opposite over hypotenuse. should just be 1 half. And cosine 30 degrees should be root 3 over 2. And you can stick that in your calculator and check it to make sure that it actually works. If you do 30 degrees and make sure you're in degrees, or do pi over 6 if it's radians, you'll get an 0.5. So yeah, you could just calculate this in your calculator. That would be fine. But I'm going to use these numbers because I happen to know them. So I know in this case that L hat is equal to, now here's the other I have to think about. It's in the plus i, but plus x, but minus y direction. So it's 1 half comma minus root 3 over 2 comma 0. And these are simple. The advantage of this, these are simple enough numbers that I can just plug them in as numbers. I know you're all excited. I don't have to call it you know, L hat dot X hat and L hat dot Y hat. I could just put those in as numbers. Or I could call it sine theta. Sorry. Yeah. Did I do this wrong? I did it backwards. You should all be yelling at me now because the X was the cosine and the cosine is root 3 over 2. So it's root 3 over 2, comma, minus 1 half, comma, 0. That's really what it is. So I could have called that cosine theta minus sine theta, but I'm going to stick with this for now. So that's what L hat is. Second question, what is the force of the spring on the block? At this point, I can really just plug in. Because we know that the force of a spring on the thing it is connected to is minus k times L minus L naught times L hat. So. And I already have all these numbers, so I'm just going to plug in, because that's all that's necessary to do here. So it's minus 137 newtons per meter times L minus L naught. So L is 0.37 meters. L naught is 0.25 meters. Okay. L minus L naught times L hat, which I'll draw as a column vector. So that's root 3 over 2 minus 1 half 0. 
And if I calculate all three of those out, I'll do that on my calculator. All right, having done that on my calculator, I get, in the x direction, how many sig figs do I have? Well, 0.37 minus 0.25 would have been 0.12, so that still has two sig figs. These probably have two sig figs, because 30 degrees is wherever I wrote 30 is probably good to two sig figs. That's three. I really have two sig figs, so I'm going to stop here. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to write one too many sig figs, just because it'll make me feel good about myself. 14.2 newtons. Um, sorry, I forgot the negative. So it's negative 14.2 newtons plus 8.2 newtons, zero. Even though there's only two sig figs in this, I decided to write both of these to the same precision. So that's what the force of the spring is. And if you think about the direction, it's negative in x and plus in y, and that is what we expect, right? going that up that way. That would be negative at x and plus and y, and so the force came out in the right direction. So that's the force of the spring. Third question, where'd I put it? Here it is. Third question, my desk has become a mess. Can you conclude that there are any forces other than the spring and gravity acting on the block? Well, all right, I'm asking about forces. I'm gonna start, as is often the case, with a free body diagram. So there's the mass that way, and there's the spring, not mg, mg that way, and the spring force that way. And it's actually interesting in this case to, to figure out what's the magnitude of gravity. It's 0.125 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. That's going to come out to about 1.2 newtons, if I do it right. So notice that the uh, magnitude of gravity is quite a bit lower than the magnitude of the spring force by about a factor of 10. It's not completely insignificant, but it's quite a bit lower in this case. So really, I should probably draw this arrow not as long and this arrow a lot longer. But if you look at this, there is some gravity. It's not just the spring force. The net force is going to be sort of in that direction. And now I'm violating my rules because you're not supposed to draw net forces on free body diagrams. But OK, I'm done with the free body diagram. Now I'm trying to explain things. The net force is that way, which means this mass, if I pull it out this far and I let go of it, it'll accelerate that way. But I told you the spring is constrained to move along this direction. Right? And so if the spring is constrained to move along this direction, that means the mass somehow is being forced to move along that direction. The only way that could be is if there is another force on this mass. I don't know what it is, but I can conclude there must be another force on this mass so that the thing actually accelerates back that way instead of off at some weird angle. One way to do this would be to actually put a frictionless board here like this, and then we'd have a normal force like that, and then the three of these potentially could sum up to be just along that direction, and we'd be okay. All right, that's the first problem. And the second problem, suppose you have two springs. Both springs are made of the same metal. Both springs have coils wound equally tightly, have coils of equal radius, and have strands of metal of equal radius. Right? What I mean by that is that if you look at an actual spring, it sort of coils around and comes back up. And Wow, can I draw in 3D like this? And coils around and comes back up. All right. When I say the coils of equal radius, that's that radius. When I say the strands of metal have equal radius, that's this radius. Okay, well, I really drew that horribly, but I, hopefully you get what I mean. If I was really good, I'd have a little 3D thing pop up here with a little arrow showing what the coil radius is, and another little arrow showing what the strand radius is. Um, but that would probably be an awful lot of effort, so I don't think I'll do that. Okay. Okay, in other words, the springs are identical. If they had the same length, they would have the spring, same spring constant. However, one of the springs is twice as long as the other spring. How do their constants compare, right? So I have two springs that are constructed identically, except for the fact that one is twice as long as the other one. So let's just call that K2 and a K1. K1 for the single length, K3 for the double length. How do the spring constants compare? I don't know. Oh, look, there's a hint. Approach this by modeling the double length spring as two of the normal length strings connected together. Where they are connected, there's a small massless bead. Aha! So, what I'm going to do is think about the force. If I have two of the single length strings and I have a little bead there, okay, and I have another 
guy there. I'm just going to get to the end. I'm going to ask, what is the net spring force on this guy? So well, I have to be a little to... more careful about the variables I set up. So before I do that, let's actually set up some variables. So first of all, x naught is the equilibrium length of each spring. They're identical springs in this case because they're both single length springs. So they have the same x naught. Um, I'm going to define x1 as that length and x2 as that length. So the whole, the actual position of mass m is x1 plus x2, right, compared to the base there. Good. Now, if you think about it, the equilibrium length of these two put together is 2x0. Because if this spring was at equilibrium and this was the equilibrium, then the mass would be x0 plus x0 away. And I've stretched both springs. Here's another thing I want to argue. Well, I don't have to argue it. So here's what we want to think about. First of all, if this guy is just stretched and everything's at rest, there are no forces on this bead other than the force of spring one that way and the force of spring two that way. Because it's a massless bead, there's no gravity. It turns out I don't even need it to be at rest. If it's a massless bead, the net force on it has to be zero. Because by F equals MA, if M equals zero, then A has to be zero. I'm sorry, A doesn't. Whatever A is, F has to be zero. Um, there really are massless particles like photons. And it does turn out that gravity does have an effect on photons. Um, and you can even predict what that effect would be with Newton's gravity. Even though really I'd say, well, but if I divide by zero, I'm going to get A of undefined. But there is a way to do it with limits if you're a little bit careful. It turns out you get the wrong answer. And experiments have been done to show that the bending you get by light is different from what Newton's gravity would predict. And that was one of the first confirmations that Einstein's general relativity is correct. But that's way, way, way off topic. So the point is here is that this guy's mass is zero, so the net force has to be zero. So from that, I can conclude that the magnitude of spring one has to equal the magnitude of spring two. Right, that must be true if if this if the ma um, the bead has zero mass, and of course the magnitude of spring one is k times the absolute value of x one minus x zero has to equal k times the absolute value of x two minus x zero, and given that they're both stretched, this would also work if they were both squished. Since they're both stretched, I know the absolute value doesn't matter because this x1 minus x0 is positive. So it becomes kx1 minus x0 is equal to kx2 minus x0. The only way to make this work, I could go ahead and solve this by adding kx0 to both sides and dividing both sides by k, is x1 has to equal x2. That's the only way to make this work. So that's what you get from this massless bead. So now what I want to think about here is that I have this mass the spring force on the mass is going to be the effective K, or what we call K2, right, times the X of the spring, which is X1 plus X2, minus the equilibrium length of the whole thing, which we've argued is 2X0, right? So X1 plus X2 is the position of the mass. 2X0 is the equilibrium distance of the mass from the wall. So this K must be the K that gives me the right force with these so that I figure out that's what the effective spring constant of these two things together is. Well, knowing that x1 and x2 are the same, that's 2x1 minus 2x0, that's equal to 2 um, times k2 times x1 minus x0. That's the force of the spring, but that is the force of this one spring. And I know what the force of that one spring is. That's just k times x1 minus x0 or k1 as I was calling it before. I don't know why I'm drawing it at an angle. It has to equal 2k2 times x1 minus x0. The only way, again, divide both sides by x1 minus x0, I get that k is equal to 2k2, or k2 is equal to k over 2. So what I figure out here is that k2 is equal to k1 over 2. That's how they relate. If you have two springs of identical construction and one is twice as long as the other, it will have a lower spring constant and if, this is, if it's twice as long, it'll be a factor of two. It turns out if you did other lengths, it would be related to the length in a similar sort of way. 
Or another way of saying that is if I take a long spring and I cut it in half, I will get two springs where each one has double the spring constant that's going from K2 to K1, and K1 is 2 times K2. So that's what happens when you consider two springs of identical construction except for the number of coils. So it really matters how many coils are there, not just how tight they are and what kind of metal you have. That is the second problem. Two objects are on a sloped wooden board initially at rest. I won't draw this in 3D. I'm going to draw two little things and we'll accept that these are sort of next to each other. One is a wet bar of soap and it can slide without friction. The other is a small rubber wheel which will roll without slipping. So we have a, here's our rubber, rubber wheel. And then, you know, here's our sloped wooden board ends there and I'm going to assume they start the same distance away. The question is, which one will reach the bottom first or will they reach it at the same time? Now, if I had a bunch of bars of soap all of different masses, they would all reach it at the same time. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and work out how long it takes this guy to reach it because it's not very hard and we've done it before. So, um, free body diagram for this. I'm going to have gravity downwards. I'm going to have a normal force that way. And that's it because there's no friction on this guy. So I'm going to define my coordinates in this tilted way like this. So x is down. So um, a vector is now equal to a comma zero comma zero because it's going to accelerate entirely in the x direction. So I don't have to worry about the y or z directions. The normal force points entirely along the y direction. So what I can say now is that um, the mass times the x acceleration is going to be equal to, I'm going to write it like this, f sub g x. What is f sub g x? Well, let's look at this. So I want a component parallel to y and a component parallel to x. So I know this length is mg. That's the force of gravity is mg. And the question is, which of these two angles is theta? Well, here's theta here. Let's call that theta. I didn't tell you in the problem. It doesn't matter, but we're going to call that theta. All right, this is perpendicular to horizontal. And um, the x-axis, sorry, not the x-axis, the y-axis is perpendicular. The y-axis is perpendicular to the plane. So that is perpendicular to the plane. This is perpendicular to the horizontal. If I take this and I rotate it by 90 degrees, I now have the horizontal and the plane, which means this is what theta is. So ma in this case is just equal to mg sine theta. I know that because fgx divided by mg has to be sine theta because it's opposite over hypotenuse. Or a is equal to g sine theta. And now I can use x is equal to x0 plus v0 xt plus 1 half axt squared. This is constant. g is constant. Theta is constant. So a is constant. Um, let's call 0 where it starts. It has to get to d. It starts at 0 speed. So d has to equal 0 plus 0 plus 1 half, and I'm going to plug in ax, g sine theta t squared, or t is equal to the square root of 2d over g sine theta. That is the time it takes the soap to get to the bottom. That wasn't even part of this question, but I sort of did that anyway. What about the wheel? Why is it not the same? And here's why. The wheel starts at rest, but it's going to roll without slipping, which means a little bit later, it is now rolling, which I'll indicate like that. And if it's rolling, what it means is a little bit later, so the dot is after it's rolled down a little bit, it starts to roll. It has a non-zero angular velocity. In fact, if I use the right hand rule, curl my fingers around, the angular velocity is into the page here as drawn. So now it has some omega. So omega is not equal to constant because it started at zero and now it's omega. What that means is there must be a net torque into the board. And that begs the question, what is the force giving you this torque? So let's draw a free body diagram. We know that there's gravity on this wheel. We know that there's a normal force on the wheel. Okay. What else could there be? Well. There could be static friction. It's not kinetic friction, that's sliding friction. It's static friction because this point doesn't slide. That's what rolling without slipping means, that this point 
is at rest with respect to the ground. So since it's at rest, there could be static friction. Now, let's think about the torques that we get from these three things. Uh, the torque, I don't want to use that color, I've already used that color. Use this color. The torque that we get from gravity is, well, zero. I'm going to choose torques about this point because that's also the point I was talking about omega about, sort of the obvious point to do. There are other ones you can use, but I'm going to do that. So that's my pivot point right there. Um, torque of gravity is zero because the lever arm is zero. The torque due to the normal force, there is a lever arm for the normal force. It's like that. But notice that Rn and Fn are exactly opposite each other because, all right, so that's also zero because when I take the cross product of two anti-parallel vectors, so Rn cross Fn, even though Rn isn't zero, the cross product is zero because the offset from the center to where the normal force acts is exactly zero. So all that's left is the torque due to the static friction force. Well, that's also Rn. It's the same thing. So the, the magnitude of that is Rn times FSF. This is a right angle. So that's the magnitude of the torque. And finally, the, correction, uh, the question is which direction? Well, R cross F, using the right hand, I start pointing along R, curl my finger so it points along F. It is into the board. So let's see, X, Y, so Z hat has to be out for that to be right-handed. So the torque hat into the board is minus z hat. And sure enough, it's in the minus z hat direction. So this force must be greater than zero. I can conclude that FSF is greater than zero because that will give me the torque I need to get the thing rolling. Well, so now, having figured that out, if I think about what are the x forces, if I say, the mass of the wheel times the x acceleration of the wheel is going to equal the mass of the wheel times the x component of gravity. It's the same thing we thought about there, uh, g sine theta minus the force of static friction. And so just looking at this, I say ax is equal to g sine theta minus fsf over the mass of the wheel. I can just look at this, compare it to this, it's less than A of the bar of soap. They both start from rest. The bar of soap is accelerating always faster than the wheel. So it will always have a higher velocity than the wheel. So it will actually reach the bottom first. So the answer is bar of soap wins. Never bet against a bar of soap. Here's your opportunity to see another piece of my office. It's like the kitten calendar. Oh, don't tell anybody. I'm going to put the kitten calendar back up. All right, here, this problem, I'm asking the question, if you lean against the wall, with your head against the wall, so like this. So there I am, leaning with my head against the wall. It's like doing head desk or face palm, but it's head wall, okay? So lean with your head against the wall. Okay, that's fine. If I stand farther away, and now lean, and here I'm going to do this safely, lean against the wall. That hurts a little more. In fact, it's starting to hurt my head because it's pushing harder on my head. And if I go back, there goes the kit calorie again. Farther still, and I lean forward, out, that starts to really hurt my head. And I, I'm even in the frame. Ugh, maybe I was barely in the frame, but yeah. So why, why, why does that hurt more? That's the question. So let's try and model this. We have a couple of circumstances. One, here's me standing like this. Okay, here's my hand. Head against the wall. Okay, and here's me again at a higher angle. There's my foot, there's my hand. And the question is, why? Well, all right. What does it really mean to say my head hurts more? Why was my head hurting? Because the wall was pushing on it. Well, the wall pushing on my head, of course, is the normal force of the wall on my head. And the suggestion is the normal force is bigger there. Why? Why is the normal force bigger when it's like that? Well, that's an interesting question. 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just take myself at some angle. And I am going to draw me a free body diagram. And I'm going to draw all of the forces that are acting on me. So here at my center of mass, which isn't in my hand, it's in my um, mass. Never mind. It's there. It's in my gut, right? This big thing that keeps all the food I eat in it. So there's gravity that way. Let's define a coordinate system. There's the normal force of the wall on my forehead. Um, there's a normal force of the ground, so I'll say NG. FW is for the wall. FNG is the normal force of the ground. And then there is static friction that way. How do I know there's static friction that way? Two ways. First, there's a normal force that way. What else is there? Imagine if the ground was really slick and I leaned my head against it, my feet would slide out from under me that way. What's keeping that from happening? Static friction. But also, if you actually think about it, take your shoes off. Here I am taking my shoes off even though you can't see. If you go and lean against the wall and feel which way, you feel like your feet are pushing back. Well, you are pushing back on the ground. So you are pushing on the ground that way. By Newton's third law, the ground's pushing on you that way. I can put my shoes back on with the demonstration complete. So those are all the forces. I was at rest, you saw. So what we know is that the sum of forces in the x direction have to equal zero. Really, the vector sum of the forces has to equal zero. But this is three different equations, one for x, one for y, one for z. We're not going to worry about z forces because there were no forces in the z direction. But that's the way it is. Sum of forces in the x direction have to be zero. That is Fw minus Fsf. Okay. The sum of forces in the y direction have to be zero. And that's equal to force of normal force of ground minus force of gravity, which is force normal force of ground minus mg. OK. Well, there's nothing here that would suggest anything is different here. But there's also three things I don't know. I know my mass, at least in principle, and I know gravity. But I don't know what the normal force of the ground was. I don't know what the normal force of the wall was. And I didn't know what the static friction force was. So I need another constraint if I'm even going to talk about this. Well, there is another constraint. Not only was I not moving like that, so I'm not, I was staying at rest this way, so there's no acceleration in the x direction. There's no acceleration in the y direction, but also I wasn't spinning. So also the, sum of, the net sum of torques has to be 0. And I'm going to go and notice that. What I'm going to do is use this as my pivot point. Why? Because two of the forces that I don't care about, this is the force I care about, two of the forces I don't care about have zero torque from this pivot point because they're acting at this pivot point. So that means those forces go away. That'll be easy. And I'm going to notice that r cross f of that and r cross f of that are both in the plus or minus z directions. So I'll know all I have to worry about is torques in the z direction. Well, that's going to equal the gravity radius times the force of gravity. That's in the plus z direction. Okay. Um, but I better go ahead and do this as a cross product because they're not perpendicular. So I'll say that cross that. And then I have the radius of w crossed with the force of w. This had better come out in the negative z direction, right? Because I just do it with my right hand. The r is that way, the z is that way, or the f is that way. So I'm actually doing the sum of vector torques here. Well, OK, so what is rg? I'm going to draw another picture here so that this picture doesn't get too cluttered. I'm going to define this angle to be theta. I'm going to define my height to be h. And I'm going to pretend, it's not exactly right, but it's close enough that my center of mass is h over 2 away from the ground here. So then the question is, what are the components here? So that is the x component of rg. So that's rgx, which is going to equal h over 2 times, and this is the adjacent, so adjacent over hypotenuse times cosine theta. And this is the y component of rg, because from here to here is RG. This is now becoming a pretty cluttered picture. So RGY is equal to H over 2 sine theta. And likewise, for radius of the head, 
what do I want to call it, radius of the wall, because it's where my head hits the wall. That, the x component, by the way, I did make a mistake down here. RGx is actually negative, because notice it's to the left, right? Plus x is to the right, rg is going to the left. Of the wall, well, it's going to be the same thing. This whole length divided by that hypotenuse is cosine theta. So it's minus h cosine theta, because the hypotenuse is now h, h sine theta comma zero. So now I need to do these cross products. Well, I can do this. So rg cross fg is equal to rgx. So I'm going to do it like this, minus h over 2 cosine theta x hat plus h over 2 sine theta y hat crossed fg is minus mgy hat. Now when I distribute, I'm going to have minus h over 2 cosine theta times minus mg is going to give me plus mgh over 2 cosine theta times x hat cross y hat minus mgh over 2 sine theta times y hat cross y hat, but aha, y hat is parallel to y hat, so y hat cross y hat is 0, x hat cross y hat is z hat, so rg cross fg is just mgh over 2 cosine theta z hat. Very good. Next, now I have to consider um, the torque of FW. To do that, I need more space, so I'm going to erase all of this up here. So for the torque of FW, I have RW cross FW is equal to, so I have the RW components here, minus h cosine theta x hat plus h sine theta y hat crossed with, what is fw? I don't know, but I know it's all in the x hat direction, so I'm just going to call it fw x hat. That magnitude is what I'm looking for. So again, notice I'm going to have a thing times x hat cross x hat from this first term, which is going to go to zero, so I'm not even going to write it out, plus fwh sine theta times y hat cross x hat, y hat cross x hat, I erased my axes, no, here they are. If I do y, y is that way, x is that way, so if I do the cross product, notice I have to contort myself to do this, y cross x is into the board, so that's minus z hat, okay? So I get that this torque is equal to minus f w h sine theta z hat. And it turns out that I don't have to think about the forces at all. I could if I wanted to, but I don't have to. I could if I wanted to ask questions like, how far can I lean before friction won't hold me? So I'm going to erase all of this here. And we know that the sum of torques in the z direction has to equal 0 is equal to the torque from gravity. So that's mgh over 2 cosine theta. Right? And it's the z component. I don't write the z hat because I'm just doing the z component here. And then the z component here is minus f w h sine theta. I'm going to divide both sides by h. Um, add f w sine theta to both sides and divide both sides by sine theta. m g over 2 times cosine theta over sine theta, which is equal to m g, knowing that sine theta over cosine theta is tan theta, that's mg over 2 tan theta. That's what fw is. So notice, as theta goes up, if you make a plot of tan theta versus theta, it looks like, um, it looks something like that, if you go up to uh, 90 degrees, and then it goes nuts at 90 degrees, because you're dividing by zero. But between uh, zero and 90 degrees, which I'm going to write as pi over 2, because it's radians, um, tan theta looks something like that, but what's important about it is that it's going up as theta goes up. So as theta goes up, um, tan theta goes up, okay? So I'm dividing by a bigger number, so fw gets smaller because I'm dividing by a bigger number. And in fact, 
tan theta gets really huge as I get close to 90 degrees. Well, think about me leaning against the wall. If I'm leaning at a very steep angle, that's a bigger theta than if I'm leaning like this, right? That's a very small theta. This is a very big theta. So as theta gets bigger, tan theta also gets bigger. I'm dividing by a big number. The magnitude of the wall force will be less. So, and I figured this out by thinking about the torques on me. So that is a torque problem for you. And that is the end of the problems for this week.